All right, first example, determine which data display was used for each set of data and why do you think each method was chosen? The problem states that a group of schools in New England participated in a two-month study. They reported 3,962 dead animals. Uh, looking at roadkill here. 307 birds, 2,746 mammals, 145 amphibians, 75 reptiles, and 689 unknown because was, the body was so mutilated they couldn't tell. <laughs> I think that's funny, yes. All right. You know what? I've hit plenty of animals in my day. I've hit multiple raccoons that have uh, damaged the front bumper of my car which had to get the bumper replaced. And actually I was getting on a first name basis with my insurance agent. Uh, I'd have to call them and tell them, hey, I hit another raccoon. And they'd be like, all right, bring your car in. And so literally I called them on the phone like two weeks later and they're like, do you hit another raccoon? I said, no, I hit a horse. Um, <laughs> I tell you guys I hit a horse before. Yeah. Yeah. So the horse actually hit me. Um, I back where my parents live, we live close to a farm and, and, uh, on the farm, they have a couple horses. Well, no big deal to have a couple horses out, but, um, I was driving along actually back to college, just back when I was in college heading to Purdue. And, uh, I happened to be on the phone with a friend. I glanced over and saw that there was two horses running side by side, uh, perpendicular towards the road. Well, no big deal. Cause they're, uh, they're fenced in, um, a barn obstructed my view, so I couldn't see the horses anymore. So I just again, just eyes on the road. And then um, after I passed the barn, I saw with more clarity that one of the horses was inside the gated area, the fenced in area, and one of the horses was outside and going to hit me. And so I slammed on my brakes and it plowed right into my passenger door, flipped over my hood, over my car, landed on the road. This is a full size horse got up and then trotted off. <laughs> Meanwhile, you can see in the road, the skid marks of my car, because I slammed on the brakes, went shh, shh, like that. And there was a car coming in the other lane that had to slam on their brakes so they didn't get me or the horse. So nobody was hurt. The horse was, well, the horse was hurt. The horse survived. I went and checked on, I went and checked on it later because um, I know the, the family. And so I, I gave them a call and they're like, oh, we're eating dinner right now. I said, you know, you have a horse out. They're like, yeah, we knew. We couldn't get him in. So we just let him run around. <laughs> I, said, uh, I said, well, I hit it. And I said, okay, we'll go, we'll go find it. And so they gave me a call back like an hour later. And they said, yeah, it was in the back in the stall. After you hit it, it must have learned its lesson and trotted back over the stall. They said it had some bruising, but had no, uh, actually didn't like it was going to survive. It was going to be fine. So. My car, on the other hand, was out of commission for a while. Let's just say I didn't go back to Purdue. Well, actually, I did go back to Purdue that night. I had to take, uh, fortunately, my mom had a car she wasn't using at the time that I was able to borrow. But um, yeah, that was, a, that was a whole ordeal. And then in the paper, because, you know, the, the report all the accidents. If you actually look in, in the paper, you'll see, like, all the accidents that reported to the police. Well, in order for insurance to get involved, we have to report this to the police. And so it said, my name in the paper said, my name hits horse. Everyone else is like, ah, speeding ticket, speeding ticket, whatever. <laughs> it, said, it just said, Jacob Bright hits horse. Uh, and then it said the name of the road. And I was getting text messages from friends. And they're like, you hit a horse. I'm like, okay, they have the story backwards. It hit me. There's a difference. Like I wasn't driving, you know, it's not like it was a deer in the middle of the road. Like it's not understandable, like a horse is a little bit crazy, but the horse did not become roadkill and that's what's important so anyways what kind of graph are they using to represent this roadkill do we know do we have a title of this what what is this kind of data display called jimmy it's called yeah it's called a, uh you could either call it uh, a lot of people either call it a, a circle graph or also called a pie chart Okay, you probably have looked at a lot of these over the course of time. So you've got mammals up there taking the biggest slice of the pie, the 2,746. And then you've got each of the other um, categories displayed. Okay, why do you think that they chose a pie chart? What do you think, Lizzie? 
you're right. Yeah, it's easy to see according to the slivers of pi what groups had more roadkill in them, right? Do you think a pie chart or a circle graph is the only way to display this data? No, there's other ways. We could talk about at least one other way um, that we could display this data later on. All right, second one, black bear roadkill. Oh, I don't like this one as much. I know. The data below shows the number of black bears killed on estate roads from 1993 to 2012. I don't know. There are more black bears, I suppose, or more people driving or both. Uh, what kind of data display did they use? What is this called here? Arson? It's a scatter plot. Yeah, you guys have been working with these this chapter. This one's called a scatter plot. Why do you think they chose to use a scatter plot? Yes, Sander? Yeah, because they wanted to show us there's a positive trend here, right? Or, I mean, positively sloped. I wouldn't say it's a positive thing that's happening, right? Uh, but the, the trend, it's trending positive, meaning as time increases, time goes by, so does the number each year of black bears that are being hit by cars. Um, it's not the only way they could have displayed the data, but they chose to use a scatter plot here, and then they drew their line at best fit. Could you find the equation of that line at best fit? Sure you could, especially if I told you two points that I was sure it went through, like this one here, and nah, never mind. <laughs> that might be a little bit of, I mean, we could, we could estimate the, the equation. I'm not sure if I'm gonna be able to find the exact equation of that without for sure knowing which two points it goes through, but we could estimate it. Um, but we did that last section, so I won't bother doing that right now. And then finally, we have raccoon roadkill. A one-week study along the four-mile section of road found that the weight, the following weights in pounds of the raccoons, I might have been responsible for a few Why of them. Why are they weighing dead raccoons? I don't know. Wait, were they just like picking up like you? Listen, you can find data in anything. So uh, they weighed those roadkill raccoons, and they... Uh, used this kind of data display. Now this is called a stem and leaf plot. Oops. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. Okay, but if, if a raccoon gets run over by a car, if you find the roadkill, if it gets run over by a car, it's going to be squished its guts all over the place. All right, all right, all right. That's enough, that's enough. All right. We don't need to talk about all that. Now, a stem and leaf plot, I don't know if you guys have seen these before, but they usually come with a key. And so on one side of the stem and leaf plot, in this case, we have the uh, ones digit. And on the other side of the stem and leaf plot, on the other side of that line, we have the tenth digit. So what it does is it not only orders the numbers from least to greatest, but allows you to see what, um, what's the best way of saying this, what number, what what range more of the, um, the roadkill is in. So for example, I'm seeing a lot of raccoons that were in the 14 pound range. Do you see what I'm saying up here on the stem and leaf plot? You can see there are more raccoons that are in the 14 pound range than in the 13 pound range. There's also an equal number of raccoons in the 17 pound range, the 18 pound range, and the 21 pound range. Now, those, those numbers up there actually represent four. So in this last one here, that'd be 21.3, 21.5, 21.5, and 21.5. Okay, um, you don't have to use decimals with stem and leaves. You could have one side of the stem be the tens digit, the other side be the ones digit, and it does the same thing. Okay, it gives you that same data. It's just displayed a little bit differently. They do go in numerical order though. Okay, from top, which is the least, to greatest, which is on bottom. Uh, what do you think can be done to minimize the number of animals killed by vehicles? Lizzie? No. <laughs> don't drive as much. Yeah, that might help. What else could we do, Xander? Make the raccoons smarter. Make them smarter? Stop driving. Maybe. Cars. Yeah, Julia? Um, you can like, make a tunnel like, underneath the road so that they can go. See, that's an interesting idea. So she said make a tunnel. Um, there are actually, and I, I, maybe I can find some later, there's like overpasses where they, instead of a tunnel, they built like a bridge yeah. over where animals have that free range to cross over so they're not using the road to cross over uh to some states have implemented those and they seem to be working pretty well owen or no, it was owen sorry seth and then owen 
Um, not drunk drivers? Not drunk drivers. Yeah, I, I, I hope that people aren't drunk driving. I don't know if all the roadkill, we, I hope that none of it's because of a drunk driver. Um, I mean, I wasn't drunk driving when I hit a horse. So it's not, so not we're not correlating those things together, but that uh, would certainly be something that we'd advocate for entirely, people whether roadkill or not. Owen? Okay, but you, get, you know, those are expensive. And so now we're increasing taxpayer dollars and you can see why some people wouldn't want to do that. But yes, that would help as well. Yes. I mean, after doing stuff like this, like you did like Donald McGrath like this with email, like, oh, a lot of raccoons got killed on this road. Then you could like put up like signs like, hey, there are raccoons, you can stop being stupid when you're on this road. Raccoon crossing, all right? Yeah. Just like there was a moose crossing sign up here. So, okay. If you know that the animals are that much, you could look out for them. You could be more cautious. So there are several methods, several methods of displaying data, uh, each representing the data in a different way. Here are the ones you're gonna need to know for Tuesday's test. We have the pictograph. A pictograph shows data that uses pictures. Think of it as a bar graph, but more childlike, right? Uses pictures and pictographs usually come with a key and they would say one, each bird represents 10 birds or each bird represents 100 birds. So then when you have a half a bird, you know that's half of 100, which would represent 50. Pictographs aren't used very often. Bar graphs are typically what you'd use instead of a picto pictograph. A bar graph shows data in specific categories. So go back to the first problem we had with different types of roadkill. Each type of roadkill is its own different category. So. You could display it as a circle graph. You could also display it as a bar graph with each bar being its own, you know, mammals, reptiles, amphibians, and so on and so forth. So that's what a bar graph is used for. We've already talked about circle graphs. Circle graphs display data as part of a whole, okay? And this last problem, it was our whole study, all the animals, right, were represented on the circle graph. Circle graphs are also used very commonly with percentages. So I put a percent sign there. If you see percentages, sir, percentages, I can't even say that word. I said percentages like uh, the equations that I have my other classes do. Anyways, if you see percentages, that's a good indicator that you would uh, want to use a circle graph because what would the entire piece of pie be out of that, Xander? 100%. 100%. Now, line graphs. Line graphs are not the same as bar graphs. Well, obviously they're not, but you don't actually display the data the same way. Line graphs, are used to show how data changes over time. Underline where it says over time. Although you could go into some sort of software and you could graph all the different types of animals and you could do like a line graph like that. That's not how a line graph is supposed to be used. This would be more of a bar graph or a circle graph. A line graph is gonna show how things change over time. For example, you could also um, then the black bear roadkill, you could have used a line graph for that. And uh, now the line graph for that would have been connected these lines to make it look like this. But uh, obviously what they were trying to do here was show you the positive trend. And that's why they chose the scatter plot instead. But line graphs, graph data over time. Now a histogram gets mistaken for a bar graph a lot. A histogram is not a bar graph. A histogram is gonna show frequencies. So underline the word frequencies. It shows frequencies of data values or how often something occurs in intervals of the same size. So for example, if I was going to graph the data of how many electric cars were sold in the 90s, in the 2000s, the 2010s, and the 2020s, those would be, I could use a line graph for that, or I could use a a uh, histogram and I could show you that change over those that 10 year period each time. It's um, over intervals of time. So compare that to a bar graph, which just displays specific categories. What's your favorite color? Red, blue, orange, green, yellow, that'd be a bar graph. How many cars are sold in the 90s and the 2000s and 2010s? Now we're talking about a histogram. A stem and leaf plot we've already talked about orders uh, numerical data and shows how they're distributed. A box and whisker plot. Did you guys do these last year? 
Yeah. Okay, you did box muscular plus. It shows the variability that the variability that's like how spread out the data is. Remember, we talked about the range as a it, um, shows how the data varies, and so it shows that by using quartiles. And that prefix "quart" means what? A fourth. A fourth. Yeah. So one fourth of your data is inside that between those two points. One fourth of your data is there. One fourth of your data is there, and one fourth of your data is there. This number here is your lowest number. This number here is your highest number. And then the three middle dots are your three medians. How can you have three medians? Well, you have your overall median, which is found right there in the middle. That is your overall median. And then from that median all the way to your lowest number, they find the other median, the median of that lower half data. And that's what this uh, middle dot right here is. So this is the, I guess I could put this in. This is the smallest number. In case you're ever asked to graph a Boston Whisker plot again. That's the smallest number. This is the largest number. This is the overall median. Probably should shrink my text down a little bit. Then you've got the lower half median and the upper half median. So you find the median of the, so the overall median splits your data in half. Then you can find the median of the upper half of the data and you can find the median of the lower half data. And then they put a box around the three medians. And then they put a line between the one that's the overall median. Okay, so if each quartile contains one fourth, then one fourth and one fourth makes a half. And inside that box is the middle 50% of your data, if that's what you're looking for. That's what a box muscular plot will do. Okay, so it shows uh, the vari variability of data set using quartiles. Then we've got a dot plot. I like dot plots. Shows the number of times each value occurs in a data set. So each dot, let's say this is a number line, and this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Not only does it put my data in order, but it shows it how many, how often it repeats. So if I'm looking for modes, modes are really nice to use with dot plots because I can see, I can see that three would be my mode here. And then finally, we have a scatter plot, which we've talked about, shows the relationship between, and you can underline two data sets. Got an X value and you have a Y value on the coordinate plane. So with this in mind, I'm going to give you a situation and I want you to tell me the best method or the best graph chart data display I should use to show this information. The number of students in a marching band each year. What do you think, Owen? That's correct a line graph would probably be the best way of displaying that data. And why did you say line graph? Yep, shows data over time. If you're graphing data over time, you should use a line graph. That's right. A comparison of people's shoe sizes and their heights. Xander? Scatter plot. Scatter plot. You're right. Why did you say scatter plot? Yep, two data. You have two data sets there. You've got you have an you have an X and a Y, right? You've got X, which is people's shoe sizes. You've got Y, which is people's heights. And you can see if there's a correlation, which I'm sure there probably is, positive correlation between shoe size and height. The population of United States divided into age groups. Someone new. Jacoby. I wouldn't do Boston Whisker here. Not saying you couldn't do that. I'm saying it's not going to be the best way of displaying this data. Christian? Possibly. A circle graph would probably be better than a Boston, Boston Whisker plot. It's still not the best one. Shane? Scatter plot, no. A scatter, I'd have to have a, a point for each person. 
that means I'd have to have 350 million dots on my scatter plot. I don't really feel like doing that. Jimmy? Not a bar graph. Carter? Histogram? A histogram. And the reason I would use a histogram is because, because I'm sp splitting in the, uh, into certain age groups, those age groups are continuous. And I, if I didn't have you write that, but you need to write the word continuous next to the word histogram. That should be continuous intervals. And so the reason for that, like this could be my histogram. I'd have people age zero to 10. Sorry, my text is too blank. My, it's too big. Let's try shrinking that down. I could do zero to 10 in this one. I could do 11 to 20 in this one. I could do 21. So they're going to continue. Whereas a bar graph is going to be different categories that are not even related to each other. Red, green, blue. It's not, nothing's continuous there. Whereas these, the number ranges are continuing to grow. They pick right up where the other one left off. That's what a histogram would be used for. A circle graph, possibly, but even within a circle graph, I'd have to show that each sliver represented a, you know, ages zero through 10 or something like that. It'd be a lot easier just to do that on a histogram. Okay, so the histogram would be the best one to use here. Example D, Sky, what do you think about this one? The percentage of students in your school who play basketball, football, soccer, or lacrosse? Yes, a circle graph. And the, oh, all right. the key there, how did you know that? Yeah, yeah, and, and so definitely if it, if it gives you the percentage as well, right? That's that percent, all those percentages are gonna add up to 100 and that's gonna be the whole data set. And so if you see percentages, circle graphs, your best bet. What if you conduct a survey at your school about insects that students fear the most? Deegan? A bar graph. I would totally put that in a bar graph because each insect is gonna be its own category. You wouldn't say that each insect is continuous with the other insects, like a number, intervals are like the histogram with the age groups. I would go with bar graph. And there's one more that I think you could use that if you really wanted to, not a dot plot, Brady. Julia, you could use a pictograph and you could make each insect represent, you know, five people that chose that insect or something. And then you could actually give your you give it some, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like design or give it, you know, make it stand out a little bit more. And so, especially if you're doing insects, that's something you could like make like, like an ant or something. And do that. So oh, who, I wouldn't be afraid of an ant. Spider, you could do spiders. Yes, Carson? Maybe, maybe make each one be 10 instead of five. Like that's what you're saying. Yeah, and that might be better. And then a half a spider would be five people that said that. Half a uh, centipede would be five, uh, five people that said centipede. So really? You know, when I moved to uh, Rooshville for the first time, I didn't realize how common those were. Like those house centipedes. We had them in our house. We had like six of them in our house. Yeah, I just moved into the house. I had no idea. Like I was, and they're fast. They're like speedy. There's nothing worse than an insect that's fast. It makes your heart. It makes, it makes me cringe just thinking about like, I remember laying on the couch watching TV and then watching one crawl across the floor and I freaked out. I'd never, I didn't even, I thought they were poisonous. I had no idea what they were. I was like Googling what these things were, but turns out they actually eat other insects and so they're actually good. But I'm sorry, if you make your, if you eat your insects outside, you make your way into my house and you're getting flattened. So. <laughs> she played with the food, that's what happened. All right, you record the number of hits for your school's new website. Now hits is like every time somebody clicks on your website uh, for five months. Tell whether the data display is appropriate for representing how the number of hits changed during that five months. Explain your reasoning. So um, this one, they, calculated the number of hits using a bar graph, it looks like. Is that uh, appropriate? Xander? Yeah. Why do you say it is? Um, because they're different categories. Okay. Are, what are the categories? So we're tracking something over 
period of time. Okay, so I do agree this is a bar graph. But Xander, if they're tracking it over a period of time, what should they have used? Uh, line graph. A line graph. Now, I'm not saying someone couldn't display data that way, but I'm saying it's not typically the best way of doing that. So instead, we would want to say use a line graph because they're tracking it over time. Leave the bar graph for the insects. This data display is called what? What are they using in example B here? Julia? Uh, histogram. histogram, okay. And is a histogram the best way of displaying this data or is it a good way of displaying this data, I should say? I'm not sure if you can say best way since it's the same question, you have different ways of doing it. Let me ask you this, in order to be a correct histogram, it has to be continuous data and it has to have intervals of the same size. Is the data continuous? Yeah, it's going from zero to 399 and then 400 to 799. Is, are those intervals the same size? Yeah, for each 400. From zero to 399 is 400 numbers. You've got to include zero as one of those numbers. From 400 to 799 is 400 numbers, right? So these are all the same size. I would say that this is an appropriate way of displaying the data they have listed. That works because again, the numbers are continuous. The intervals are equal. You could track it that way. And then you could see that uh, So I'm looking at this now that I think about it, I think this is okay, except you'd have to you'd have to give more detail. When it says frequency and then it says two, that means there was two months that had between zero to 399 clicks and 400 to 799 clicks. It doesn't tell you which two months it was though, does it? At least the bar graph did that. Of course, a line graph would have been better. So you know what, now the more I think about this, I think this is not an appropriate way of displaying it for the same reason. Although it does tell you how many months, it doesn't tell you which months they were, and that might be important to know. I bet you people don't use the school website very much over the summer. Or maybe right into, maybe maybe they do right as you know, school's getting ready to start back up and they need to figure out when registration is going to be and that stuff. But you're right. Or over Christmas break, no one's probably using the school website. So I want to know, I would want to know that data over that time. What about this next display? What is this called? Chloe, what's this kind of display called? A line graph. And Chloe, do you think the line graph is the best way of displaying it? Yeah. I do too. And as we already mentioned, it's displaying it over time, which I already wrote up there, but I'll write it again. It's over time. All right. Now we're going to look at some ones they didn't use and, and explain whether it's appropriate or not. A dot plot. Would a dot plot have worked here, Xander? No. Why? Dots. Too many dots. You'd have to have one. December has 925 dots. Also, a dot plot is going to be used over an axis where the axis is numbered. And so unless you are numbering the months, which I guess you could do, still probably not a good way of doing that one. So I'm going to say no for this one. A circle graph. Would a circle graph have worked? Could you make each sliver of the circle graph a, a month? You could have, but do circle graphs you work very well over time? No, that's what the line graph is used for. Okay. Now you could arrange your circle graph so it went in order. Most people, most of you would probably do that, but it's not the best way of displaying. Um, I wouldn't say it's the most appropriate way. A stem and leaf plot. We're on one side, you've got a number. On the other side, you've got a number. No. If I did a stem and leaf plot for this, it looked like this. I'd say on, on one side, you have your hundreds digit. On the other side, you have your tens digit and one digit. That doesn't really do anything for me, right? 
that I already, I already knew that information. I wasn't able to display it in any sort of meaningful way. So stem and leaf plot, no. What about a pictograph? Xander? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I agree. Unless you were using some sort of like mouse and every, every mouse was gonna be like, 100 clicks or something, I guess you could do that. But even then a pictograph and a bar graph are very similar. If we're gonna say that the bar graph isn't the best way of using it, uh, then we're definitely gonna have to go with um, pictograph being, no. I would say, let's put maybe, let's put maybe for the pictograph, let's put maybe for the circle graph, let's put maybe for those because I think it could work. In fact, then you gotta go back up and put maybe for the bar graph. It could work. It's not the best way, but um, there are certain ways you definitely wouldn't want to display it, of which are the dot plot and the stem and leaf. What about a scatter plot? Is that going to work very well? Connor, what do you think about the scatter plot? Yeah, I would, I would have to agree. Uh, you're, you're plotting clicks, numbers of clicks over time. And again, that means that's the same reason we said about the uh, dot plot. You'd have to give each of the months a numerical value, and then you've lost some of your audience already that you're trying to split that data to. Yes? I don't think you could do a picture graph because how would you represent 85? Like 485. <laughs> that's a good point. Uh, maybe instead of making each of the mouse, uh, uh, each picture of a mouse 100, maybe you make it like 50, and then you get partial. Uh, yeah. I would say you could, let's put less maybe. <laughs> I like this one less than the other maybes. You're right. It wouldn't be able to give you an accurate number because you're gonna make, have to make a prediction off that. Like what, what does it mean with, if this is my mouse, with my little cord, right? What's it mean if they take that and get rid of that much of it. Like now, do you know what that is? Is that two thirds of it? Is that one half of it? Like, you're right. Let's just put no. Let's just put no for that. You've convinced me, Xander. We're gonna go with no. Bar graph, possibly pictograph, I'm not a fan. I've been persuaded against, dis dissuaded, I've been dissuaded. All right, let's finish this up. Which line graph is misleading and explain why? It's the same thing. You're plotting the same data. The years are the same. What's different about these, Jacoby? You're right, yeah. In fact, we remember earlier in this section, we talked about there being a break in the axis right there. Um, because they only they started graphing at eight, they made those boxes bigger because of that, right? Because they only had like eight, nine, and 10 to show. And 11, I guess the next number would be 11. Because of that, it looks like there's a larger difference from 2005 to 2009, especially, than there is if you graph it like this and you use even intervals. So it'd be an interesting way of trying to persuade your audience one way or the other by taking this and making it a break. Because if you're trying to show them that movies have really, really increased over that four year period, you, you, you would have uh, convinced me. If you would have shown me this graph, I would have said, well, it didn't increase that much. Although we are talking about billions of dollars. So who am I to say that another billion and a half dollars isn't, isn't much? Lizzie? It doesn't look as specific. It doesn't look as specific. Can you, what do you mean by that? Okay. So I wouldn't say that means it's misleading. I would say that they could have possibly used different intervals here, maybe to make it look that way. The break definitely makes it look misleading. So this is called a break. It definitely makes it look misleading. However, I think Lizzie's onto something here. If they would have just, instead of counting by, I don't see, I don't know what you count by then. What do you count by? Because if you count, if you count by ones, then your graph is going to be really, really, you won't have any important data until you get up to here in your graph. 
and uh, I can see why they counted by twos. But yeah, um, if you want to show that, maybe you just zoom in on a particular part. You know, it's kind of what they did, but it definitely makes it look misleading. You can argue anything to make it look misleading. It's true. I mean, well, think about it though. If you if you compare compare this distance here to this distance here. Whoops. Try that again. Compare that distance there to that distance there. They look like they're about the same, right? So could you convince someone that your movie sales have doubled from 2005 to 2009? You might be able to convince someone of that. Have your movie sales really doubled though? To go from eight and nine billion to 10.4 billion? That hasn't doubled, has it? It sure looked like it doubled because of the way the break was being used. What about this one? Same kind of thing, except now they're doing a bar graph instead of using a line graph. They're using a bar graph now. Which one's misleading? Carter? Um, the first one, I think. And why? Because it's got a break. Another break, yep. It looks like cell phones C and D have twice as many or cost twice as much as cell phone B according to the heights of their bars. But then if you look at this one, which doesn't use the break, cell phone B really isn't that much, uh, not that much cheaper than cell phone C and D. You're looking at a cost of $90 versus $100. It's a $10 difference. It didn't look like it was a $10 difference here though, did it? That's, I'm sorry, a $9 difference. It didn't look like it was a $9 difference. You could persuade someone to fit by the, uh, the cheaper phone and it's only like nine less dollars. Yeah, and they think they're getting a really good deal. They're not really getting that good of a deal. What about C? Why would one be misleading over the other? Lucy? Why do you say it's misleading? Counting by tens instead of twenties, does that make it more misleading or less misleading? It makes it look like there's more of a change. Okay. I will say this, however. Is this amount of space here the same as that amount of space here? You could make an argument that neither of these are misleading. That they're both representing the data, just one of them is more zoomed in than the other one. You definitely couldn't say that here. You couldn't say, oh, well, you're saving half, you know, this is only half the cost, because that's not true. We know that's not true. What do you think, Julia? I think that it could be like both could be misleading depending on like what you were doing for like for the cell phone. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to like argue that you should buy me because it's like so much cost less money. That's a good point. This graph is going to convince people to buy cell phone B because it looks like it's half the cost. It's really not. It's nine dollars cheaper. This graph might convince people to go ahead and go and spend the extra nine dollars on C or D. You're right. It depends on what you're trying to do. These, I would argue that neither are misleading. Sorry, Lucy. I know. I, I really uh, uh, trapped you right there when I said which is misleading because there really isn't anything wrong with either one. They don't use a break. The only difference is if my intervals here on the y-axis are 10 and this is 20. If anything, the one that uses 10 gives me a, because it's more zoomed in, gives me more information maybe, or gets spreads out that information more so I can understand it versus the one here. Now, if you're wanting to go ahead and make the argument that this one's misleading like Lucy was, it might look like there was a more significant change but you can see that really is just as significant on this side as well. All of this definitely zooms it in a little bit more. But to say that it's misleading, there isn't anything like I'm still going to give it like the person who works this many hours, it looks like they're working double the hours. They are working double the hours, right? They were working double the hours. And this person here, this increase here is the same as this increase here. So I would go neither i think that they use the uh i know the book's probably going to say that i agree with lucy that the first one's probably the one that's misleading but i really don't see anything wrong with using an interval of 10 over an interval of 20 as long as they're consistent as long as they're consistent with it you, know, you don't want to count by 10 and then count by five and then count by 10 again that's just weird 
Explain why the data is misleading. A volunteer concludes the number of cans in the food and boxes of food donated were about the same. Would you agree that these two are about the same? No. How many cans are there? How many cans were donated? 11. There are 11 cans. Each can is how many? 20. Okay. So we have 220 cans. How many boxes? I see. I see six boxes, right? Oh, there's not supposed to be a red line on that box. Each box represents also 20. Six times 20 is 120. It's a difference of 100 more cans that were donated versus boxes. Why does it not look that way? Deegan? Yeah, yeah, they use boxes. The boxes are bigger. So it looks like about the same amount, but the boxes take up more space than what the cans do. And because of that, this is definitely misleading. Uh, next one, your friend concludes that band C's tickets are twice as expensive as band A's tickets. I could say, see a couple things of why this is misleading. Give me one of them, Deegan. There's definitely a break there. So I can see why they'd say it's twice as expensive, but it's actually going from $40 to $52, $53. That's an increase of 12. It's not doubling the price of the tickets. So that's one way it's misleading. There's another reason why it's misleading as well. Can you see why? Anyone other than Deegan, Lizzie? Yeah, the size of the ticket. So I'm going to go with the break. And I have no idea why they did that. Other than, I mean, they could have made them taller, but not wider. It's like the width of the tickets, maybe. So break and then size of tickets. You conclude that the profit in year five is much greater than year one. Oh, I see why. I was, I was confused at first. Now I see why. Why would someone say the profit in year five was much greater than one? Why would they say it, Christian? Not billions. It is billions, but that's not why. Sky? Yeah, they widened the bars. Hang on, we'll get one more. Why, why, widened? Widened? Wider bars? <laughs> Yeah, I'm not sure why they did that, but yeah, the, the, the bars got wider as you, as you, and I don't understand why they did that. And then the last one, fish are more popular than pets. Why would someone think this is misleading? Uh, because they made like the percentages lower, but they made the, like the shaded area. Bigger. Yeah, the percentages don't match the slices. Percentages don't That's the biggest slice. match the, yeah, don't match. Yeah, the biggest slice should have been 41%. These do add to 100%, but there's no way that fish was the most popular cut. Actually, dogs was, should have had that red slice. They mixed it up the numbers, mixed up the numbers. Up. All right, homework tonight's on 9.4. See you guys Monday. Have a great weekend. Yes. Would be like the like thing about them, like making the drops, um, what was, you said, like,